And hey, gang, I'm my radar meteorologist, Matthew Capucci, with a breakdown as to what exactly happened on November 13th when more than half a dozen tornadoes touched down across southern New England, a virtually unprecedented November tornado outbreak. Long in advance, meteorologists have been concerned about the potential for some rotating storms. There was a shortwave trough moving through, meaning kind of a low spin in the upper atmosphere with cold temperatures and enough instability to gel some thunderstorms, and models were showing a line sweeping through during the afternoon. It's important to note this was a negatively tilted trough. We take a look at this picture here. You see, it kind of looks like an atmospheric backslash of sorts with the worst conditions from northwest to southeast. That's kind of that punch moving through the atmosphere. And when you get that negative tilt, it has kind of more of a kick to the atmosphere. And that was crucial in making this event really overachieve. Surface temperatures weren't overly warm. In fact, most places only low to mid 50s, which doesn't really feel like traditional tornado weather, but it's all about contrasts because the upper atmosphere was so incredibly cold, you got enough buoyancy from surface air to lift all the way up and really feel the atmosphere's rotation. That manifest in very cold air, bringing hail to the surface. For example, here in Manhattan, pee to marble size hail in many spots, and later on it grew even bigger. This was shot right around one o'clock in the afternoon on that Saturday. The biggest ingredient though was helicity or spin in the lowest one kilometer of the atmosphere. There was so much energy for twist that any storms that grew tall enough to span multiple layers of the atmosphere were subject to shear or a change of wind speed and direction with height that caused just about anything that went up to rotate. And so these storms were prolific tornado producers. And even if tornadoes weren't overly strong, still an EF0, EF1 is more than enough to cause damage or even injury. The first cell to go tornado warrant occurred near Hempstead, New York. When the warning was actually issued, odds are the tornado was already on the ground, evidenced by what you see on the right. We call that a correlation coefficient signature, meaning anything in red, the radar is saying, hey, irregular shapes like rain, like hail, like snow, whatever in the atmosphere. But anything in yellow, the radar is saying the shapes are jagged, weird, not really commensurate with ordinary things. So the inference is there's debris in the atmosphere. And this was what the case was when the warning was issued. We go back before that warning came out and there was a very prominent signature on spectrum width, meaning top left panel, you're seeing kind of a greenish red blotch. And what was happening there, the radar was saying there's a lot of turbulence in those pixels, meaning a big array of motions. Wind's going in one way, wind's going in another way, objects kind of moving all over the place. And that means, odds are, there's probably a tornado in progress. On the top right, we see a kink in the line of precipitation, meaning the rear flame downdraft, cool air wrapping around on the backside of a circulation, is kind of pushing precip ahead. At the same time, there's no precip north of the spin, thanks to an inflow notch, warm, moist air rushing in to fuel the circulation. And that contrast is kind of where that tornado would occur. Here's a key element as to why the first one probably didn't get a warning. On the bottom left is velocity. You see no real change in the velocity field. But keep in mind, this radar, the National Weather Service WSR-88D1, scans several thousand feet above the ground. We had a much better view on JFK's, the airport's terminal Doppler radar, which senses lower to the ground and is more sensitive. And that signature was present tens of minutes before the first tornado touched down. Shortly thereafter, all the warnings started flowing. We saw another debris signature on radar near West Sayville. There's that blotch of yellow inside a tornado warning polygon. What was really impressive was how strong the low level jet stream was. Just a few thousand feet above the ground, winds were rushing eastwards and northeastwards at the speed of a car on the highway, which is why any storms that went up could yank that momentum down. Near East Mortis, for example, a Mesonet weather station recorded a gust of 68 knots. That's 79 miles per hour above hurricane force. Uniondale in Nassau County saw hail to about 1.5 inches in diameter, larger than a ping pong ball. Perhaps the most remarkable was the potential for two tornadoes to have actually merged. And I wanna show you this. The first part, you're seeing two little wind signatures. So green is anything towards a radar. And what you're seeing are two little areas of enhanced green. So there's probably spin or tornadoes associated with both of those. Then we switch on over to debris and you see two independent little lobes of debris that eventually merged. So it's likely that two tornadic circulations merged, either two tornadoes combined or more likely one kind of faded away and its leftover spin was ingested and cannibalized into the other. Looking back on radar, I think this occurred shortly before 3.45 p.m. At 3.41, we had two different independent circulations that eventually started to merge. The southern one kind of took a left-hand turn and was swept into the northern one, and the two recombined into one circulation that passed very close to the radar. It's remarkable to get a tornado to pass that close to the radar to begin with and get that good of imagery. But to have two tornadoes do that, 
while merging in the Northeast is entirely unheard of. This is a new event and one we'll be studying for years to come. Believe it or not, it's not the first time two tornadoes may have merged. In Hessen, Kansas, back on March 13, 1990, a dying F5 tornado faded away and its remnants were ingested into the new F5 tornado thanks to a handoff in part of what we call a tornado family. That's pretty typical. Usually the southern tornado dies off and is swept into a northern tornado that is starting to organize. It's kind of like the one tagging off to another tornado. We also had an incredibly famous event in Pilgrim, Nebraska back in 2014, when two independent EF4 tornadoes occurred right next to each other. What made Saturday's event special was that it wasn't a traditional tornado family. These were multiple kink in the line circulations along what we call a QLCS or quasi linear convective system. But something similar happened back on April 13, 2020 in Orangeburg County, North Carolina during a big time Easter Sunday tornado outbreak. And what happened, one circulation merged into another one and both had debris with them. The tornado survey from the South Carolina event showed that the northern one weak and eventually died and the southern one ingested it. And when that happened, the southern one took a right turn and strengthened. And that's kind of commensurate with something we call it the Fujiwara effect, where two circulations will kind of bow around each other or dance around each other, which sometimes happens with hurricanes, but in this case, happened with tornadoes. It was remarkable to see. It's also worth mentioning that when the merger occurred, the surviving tornado actually strengthened because now it had extra spin added to it. Now in the Northeast, this is unprecedented in November. You don't get tornado warnings like this. You don't get tornado events. And perhaps the craziest part, we got back-to-back -back tornado days. Nantucket saw a tornado warning issued on that Friday, and then Martha's Vineyard saw one on Saturday. Now, I grew up on Cape Cod. I know Cape Cod tornadoes, and I can say that climate change is definitely playing a role. In just the past four or five years, we're now seeing kind of routine tornado events during the fall, during the cold season, thanks to warmer water temperatures. You see, human-induced climate change is causing waters to warm disproportionately faster than even the air in some places. And as a result, we're adding more moisture to the air. We're keeping the air temperatures over Cape Cod, and really Southern New England in general, warmer later into the fall. But as air temperatures higher aloft cool down seasonally, that makes a greater clash. So more thunderstorms in the fall, better spin because the jet stream in the fall is more energized, and that combines into more tornado events. Climate change is having a myriad of impacts across the board on a local level. So many, in fact, that it's impossible to deduce exactly how conditions will change for every individual area. But that said, it's likely the Northeast will continue to see more tornadoes during the fall season in the years to come. Follow My Radar on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox and Windows.